Good morning, Bay Church. Why don't we all stand up? We're opening this morning with a new song. So let's put those hands together.
Oh, sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Won't you sing a little louder? Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder.
stand in the presence of the King of Glory. Lord, we remember who you are, what you've done. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the breath of life. You're the Lion of Judah. You are my provider. You are my healer. You are my comforter. You are my Messiah. You're my friend. You're my Lord and my King. There are not enough words to describe you, O oh God, but we will keep on singing your praise. It's a worthy endeavor. Lord, receive our worship this morning, O oh God. We love to praise you. Would you be glorified in this place today? Would your names fill the atmosphere? There's power in your good, good names. We give you our worship, Jesus, and we all say together, amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Bay Church, great to see you guys. Go ahead and grab a seat if you would, please. Wait a minute. I didn't hear anybody say good morning. Hey, there it is. He's our cheerleader. I'm Pastor John. This is Vontre. By the way, the Mason family are one of our great servant leader teams here at the Bay Church. And we're just going to share a few thoughts with you before we dive into uh, Bible study for this weekend. First of all, a very warm welcome to you. And um, one of the things I have read deeply on for about the last 40, 45 years is what it's like to go to church for the first time. And because I've done this my whole life, I didn't grow up in a home of faith or religion, but at 16, I began my relationship with Christ. So I know for some of you, if you're a guest, it may be a little overwhelming, a little intimidating, a little loud, a little hot. You can never get the volume and the temperature right for the whole human race simultaneously. See, all the things I know as a lead pastor, it's impossible. Okay, so it just depends on who you make happy at any given time. Um, you're in a crowd and you're going, do I know anybody? You're saying, are these people like me? Are they my approximate age? Or are these people maybe in my industry, my vocation, whatever? Here's what I want to say to you. Just relax and chill. Just go mahalo. Honestly, just sit back. Uh, there's nothing to prove, nothing to lose. We're just human beings together. And we think of church on weekends as a place of encouragement, a place where you kind of fill an empty gas tank, a place where you kind of charge up and get fresh clarity and perspective for the week ahead. And so I bid you a warm welcome. There's some connecting spots. You'll see it on our uh, LED walls as well as in the Bay Church app, uh, as well as on our website, the Church. okay? So glad you're here. Yeah. Yeah. I get to say something now. No. <laughs> um, actually, with that, um, here at the Bay Church, we want to make sure that you're able to get connected because it is a big church, and we don't want you to ever feel lost or just another number. So we have something that's called Growth Track. So if you want to get connected and you want to learn more of how you fit here at the Bay Church, Growth Track is the next best step um, you can text Growth Track to the number on the screen, and it'll actually give you information about our next Growth Track class, which is a great way for you to go ahead and learn more about what we do here at the Bay Church, and we can help steward whatever gift God has placed inside of you and make it a part of this church family. Um, also, we have been um, asking if you need prayer, please, please, please. Use our prayer number that we have. We have our brothers and sisters to my left in the prayer area who can pray with you after church for whatever prayer needs. But we also have a prayer number that you can text for whatever prayer needs that you have through the week. Anybody in here need some prayer during the work week? I said, do you need some prayer? <laughs> hey, 
Yeah, so please use that. We want to make sure that you can stay connected with us um, and stay connected with the Lord because prayer is the way we connect with our God. Um, and also, we have been asking who wants to be a small group leader? Anybody want to be a small group leader? And I am proud to say we have 40 new small group leaders. <laughs> whoop, whoop. Pastor Greg is looking for some new volunteers who wants to be in his small group. He's, he's looking for you. No, but we have a bunch of new small group leaders, and now we're looking for people who want to join small groups. And we got a ton of different types of small groups, everything from fishing to arts and crafts, men's Bible studies, women's Bible studies. We want you to get connected and find your small group. So after service, you can go out to the tent. You'll see some of our men and women in those red and beige shirts. We know you can find a group that's great for you, and you also can go out there. There's a chance for you to win some prizes, eat some kettle corn. We don't want this to be big church, okay? We want to make sure that you can stay plugged in and you can connect in a small group also and, and get to know some new of your church, some more of your church family. Thank you, buddy. We're going to worship with giving. Maybe you want to close your eyes and listen to this. It's a passage from 2 Corinthians, and it's just simply called Generosity Encouraged. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly, sowing meaning planting, whoever plants sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever plants generously will reap generously. Each of us should uh, give what we've decided in our heart to give, not reluctantly, not under compulsion. And then here's the takeaway I want you to be encouraged with. For God loves a cheerful giver. In other words, when we're giving for the right reason, when our behavior is aligned with our hearts, that's the best kind of giving. And we're going to worship with giving now three ways to give. Uh, you can give by text. You can give. Uh, the buckets will be going by here momentarily. Our servers are coming now. Or you can give online, okay? Uh, thank you much. Father, we worship now with giving. We don't give under compulsion. We just learned that from 2 Corinthians. We don't give out of sort of guilty religious duty. That's not going to be our motivation. We give cheerfully. We give gratefully. Uh, we give generously. Uh, and Father, would you continue to grow in us similar hearts to your beautiful, generous, holy heart as we give today to your work and to what most concerns you about your planet today. In Christ's name, and everyone said. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Check out this video on small groups. My name is Chris Brown. I've enjoyed bringing the church a wonderful community of Saturday morning adventure seekers that call themselves the Bay Church Hiking Group. We are surrounded by such beauty here in the East Bay. And as I grew up here as a young boy, I've learned a lot about the area through my life here and sharing time on the trails as well as experiences with other outdoor enthusiasts is the highlight of my week. So we have uh, got an active calendar of events that we uh, share time, say Saturday morning starting at 8 o'clock, usually finish around 12 or so and uh, have anywhere from 6 to 20 hikers that show up each week. It's all Bay Church, it's our friends, it's our beautiful friends and family here. We uh, just enjoy learning uh, some things about the area that we may not be uh, privy to, and also a chance to spend time with each other and walk with our, our, our tender Lord and uh, embrace each day as uh, the gifts that we have upon us and just enjoy this uh, ever so valuable fellowship. I'm Vera Knowles and I've been with the church uh, hiking group for quite a while. I am involved with quite a few other hiking groups as well and it's so nice to be out in God's creation. But it's even better to be in God's creation when you're sharing fellowship, when you're walking with Jesus, with fellow people from our church and just sharing the faith and the friendship and our experiences and really praising the Lord and thanking Him for this beautiful country He's given us to explore. As a leader of the small group, uh, community here amongst other leaders in the church. I can honestly say how valuable the experiences is, not only for the participants, but the leaders as well. The, the, the strength of our church is based on our fellowship, our uh, teamwork, uh, relationships that we built, 
and it really is heavily uh, founded by our participation in these small groups. I give the leaders of the groups a lot of credit and the value that they bring is everlasting. And what a wonderful opportunity it's been to bring this small hiking group to the Bay Church. We're in our fifth year now, and I'm super excited about next Saturday's hike. So come join us. Outstanding. Awesome. awesome. Good morning, guys. Uh, my name is Ryan. This is my wife, Sarah. And this is the joy of our life, Eden Joy Greg. And... Uh, she finally got all of her immunization shots, and today's her very first day at church. And uh, so, pretty excited. She, she tells me she wants to church shop, but we're rooting for the Bay Church as, as her home church. And uh, we got her her own little set of worship baby earmuffs so that the music's not too loud. Uh, have a look at this picture, actually. Yesterday, we tried them on, and... Um, because Daddy's, Daddy's got his headphones on, too, so we're like indie rock buddies. And, and uh, we've got a deal. The deal is, you can wear those during worship and sleep through the songs, but when Daddy's preaching, you need to take those off and sit at full attention. And then when Opa's preaching, Grandpa, you can put those back on and go back to sleep. And <laughs> that's fine. That doesn't really matter. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm a son of the church. I grew up, my dad's a pastor, and it was a great experience, actually. And we're hoping the same for our daughter. And I uh, just wanted to say thank you from our hearts for your kindness the last few months as we've been settling into a new, exciting, tiring season of life and uh, to bring our little one. And um, Sarah is, is a rock star mom. And um, especially at 3 a.m. Uh, <laughs> when um, things are going crazy. And uh, so Sarah is actually going to kick off our Bible study this morning by reading the passage. We're in Romans chapter 5, 12 through 21. And so if you're willing and able, would you stand to your feet for the reading of Scripture? Morning, everyone. Right. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God, and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many." And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Go ahead and have a seat. Let's see. <laughs> okay, here we go. Can you say bye, Eden? Bye. <laughs> you get me out of here. <laughs> uh, um, awesome. Uh, well, the passage Sarah just read, it's a dense passage we've got today, but... We're going to learn the Bible. So in the background of that passage, it's animated by one core idea, and we're just going to start there. It's really important that we see this. Uh, the idea is in the Bible, we are enrolled, so to speak, in one of two different solidarities, one of two groups that is definitive for us. We're either in the Adam solidarity, Adam is the first human, we're either in his block, his camp, or we're in the Jesus solidarity, his camp and his block. And the immediate question that you may have is, 
how does that work? Like, it's hard to see how somebody who lived a long time ago did things really way before me, how they affect my present and my future. It's, I don't really get that. And yes, that is hard to get. And you know why? It's because one of the core cultural assumptions from the world of the Bible has not only gone out of favor in our world, it has been ruthlessly, deliberately eliminated from our world. And I'm talking about the concept of kingship and specifically the representative function of kingship. We chop off king's heads in modernity. Uh, We're proud of that, but that's not how they rolled in ancient times. Think with me for a second about David, famous guy in the Old Testament. As a teenager, he came to the political awareness of his generation by volunteering for one-on-one combat with an elite special forces soldier named Goliath. And there was a lot riding on it. For everybody, the stakes were high. Listen to this. This is in the stories in 1 Samuel 17. It says this. So Goliath stood and he shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. Now here's the key part. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your slaves. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you all, and it's plural, you all shall be our slaves and you shall be enslaved to us. So here's the, the basic bargain. Goliath is saying, whoever, whoever wins this fight, what is true of him will be true of all of his people. It will be contagious. If David wins, all Israel wins too. David loses, all Israel loses. This is the essence of how kings represent their people. What is true of the one is true of the many. And this was a very common concept in in ancient times, and it's why, for example, the New Testament talks about being believers. One of the main ways to understand ourselves is we are in Christ, in the Messiah. That is language that has its roots in the Old Testament. I'll give you some examples. So from the story of David, you fast forward to the end of his life, his kingdom is fragmenting, and the The warring factions are saying this to each other. This is in 2 Samuel chapter 19. The men of Israel answered the men of Judah, two factions. We have 10 shares in the king, not financial shares, but like life share. We have 10 shares in the king and in David also, we have more than you. Why then do you despise us? He's saying we're in the David solidarity, okay? He heads our group. He's part of us. We're part of him. But what's the pushback? A couple verses later, we read this in chapter 20, verse 1. Now, there happened to be there a worthless man. Love that when the Bible just says you're utterly worthless. Whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite. And he blew the trumpet and he said, we have no portion in David. We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tent, so Israel. So all the men of Israel withdrew from David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah followed their king steadfastly from the Jordan to Jerusalem. They're saying, hey, we're out. Sorry, we're not in the David solidarity. We're not in that. We're out here. And this is the root of the New Testament language. Like, for example, very famous verse, 2 Corinthians 5.17. This is one of the great promises that we have as Christians. It says this, that if anyone is in Christ, in the Messiah... He is a new creation. She is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. It's a beautiful promise, but how does it work? It's all about understanding what in means. It's because Jesus, as the one, on behalf of the many, Jesus has experienced a new creation. He's been resurrected from the dead. Therefore, what is true of him becomes true of all those who are in him. And a big part of becoming a Christian is thinking that through, and then feeling that through, letting that become part of your like self, you know, your reflexive identity. That is who I am. Um, so let's summarize this big idea, because without it, we ain't getting anywhere today. Here's the big idea. To understand the Bible's story and how it becomes our story, we must understand representative kingship. What is true of the one becomes true of the many. And this works in both directions. It can work in a good direction. David beats Goliath. Jesus beats sin, death, and Satan. And all those who are in David, who are in Jesus, get the benefits of that. That's wonderful. But it also works in the other direction. All those who are in Goliath, 
who backed him, well, now they're an enslaved people. And as we're going to see in our study today, all those who are in Adam, they also receive some negative benefits from being part of that solidarity. The group we belong to, the whole of which we are a part, really, really matters. So our study today is going to be called this. It's the main thread, the one and the many. The one and the many. And actually, this is a Fascinating topic in in psychology, the way our perception works. Our brains are constantly going back and forth between parts and holes, parts and holes. This is a concept that travels. Uh, But today, uh, we're going to work back through the passage Sarah read a few minutes ago and see if we can't tease apart what it's trying to say to us today, okay? So, Romans 5.12. Therefore, so we're picking up from what we learned last week. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man... And death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. You see the one to the all, yes? Um, There's a negative chain reaction here outlined in three steps. First of all, sin comes into the world through a representative human. Secondly, the aftermath of sin includes death, whatever that means. We're going to talk about that. Third, uh, this complex of sin and death together become contagious. They seep out from the one to the many. I remember playing high school basketball, and uh, we used to have these ungodly practices at 5 a.m. before school. And uh, we were terrified of being late because if we were, if anybody, we were a 12-man squad. If one person, though, was like one minute late, we all had to run suicides. Anybody play any high school basketball, you know what suicides are? It's like baseline, to foul line and back, baseline to half court and back, baseline to the far foul line and back, baseline, full court and back, and our coach would time them so that we couldn't dog it. There was no jogging. If we didn't, like, full-out sprint, we had to redo it. And um, one man's sin, intentional or not, made us all feel like death at 5 a.m. in the morning. And really, personally, I wanted to, I, who I wanted to feel like death was my coach sitting on the sideline with his, like, pot belly hanging out, sipping his coffee with his whistle, Woo! Again, again, it's like, I'd like to see you run these at 5 a.m., sir. I was thinking ungodly thoughts. But he says, this is how it works. And he pulled out Romans 5. He said, one person sins, everybody suffers. <laughs> Paul says here, though, as an aside, it's just this little throwaway comment. It's really important. He says that through sin, death came into the world. Now, what does that mean? Um, you know, does it mean that, like, before our first parent sin, nothing biologically died? No trees fell over in the wind. No leaves released from their branches in the autumn. There was no transience in nature, no cyclical rhythm. Is that what it means? And is sin involved with that somehow? So this is actually a very, very deep question, and it gets to fundamental issues about the book of Genesis, which is the first book in the Bible. And if you've been at the Bay Church for a while, you may remember Recently, we spent like almost a whole year in the book of Genesis going really deep in it. And online, you can still find hours of sermons and podcasts going into all the weeds and all the flowers of Eden. Fascinating stuff. We can't do it all today. But what we can say, uh, by way of summary, and this is, a, this is a building block of a biblical worldview, we can say this, that death, and here we're referring to humanity's spiritual and physical exile from life, from the God of life. Death, in this sense, is an aberration in the biblical worldview. It, is, it was never meant to be. It was not part of God's plan. So remember back in the Garden of Eden, God told Adam, the Hebrew is Adam, that literally means just humanity. It points to his representative function. God tells the Adam, hey, look, here's this garden. Go enjoy yourself. Make it bigger, please. Make it better, please. Expand the borders. Do whatever you want. But look, there's just one thing you've got to abide. There's that one tree. If you eat of that tree, on the very day you do, you're going to die. This is Genesis 2.17. Now, what happens? Well, the old uh, forbidden fruit syndrome kicks in, and Adam and his wife Eve, her name means life, they take from the fruit. And do they die on that day? Depends on what you mean by death. (laughs) They don't like start foaming at the mouth and shaking on the ground because the apple was laced with arsenic. They actually, in a much more profound spiritual sense, die in several ways concurrently. First of all, Adam and Eve are like alienated from 
themselves, from their own bodies. They are sp- like split down the middle. They're embarrassed about their own bodies now. And they're trying to find ways to hide and deflect and close themselves off. Uh, secondly, the first couple is estranged from each other. They start hurling blame. The first marital blow up is right there. It's fascinating. The Bible describes the hostility and tension between genders as a result of the fall. Third, they lose touch with their, with their mission, with their reason for being. They were to be like God's, God's management, but in a richer sense, God's royal priesthood, vice regents over the creation. But now, uh, that whole vocation and identity starts to unravel, and it has consequences downstream. Fourth, and worst of all, sin means that our first parents are estranged now from the Lord of life. Their rebellion disqualifies them from the sort of easy, rich, free intimacy that they had previously had with their maker, and so they are exiled from the Garden of Eden. So death, this here's the big point, death is not just something physical in the Bible, something raw, empirical. It is also a spiritual alienation from the one who's behind everything, from the life force, if you'd prefer to say it that way. And on the day they sin, that death does happen. Oh, and yes, later they also do physically perish as well, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. It is the undoing of so much promised good. Now, in Romans 5, Paul, his mind is working super fast And he just nods very briefly to this sin-death connection and assumes that we know that backstory and then can connect the dots with him, how Jesus is like a second Adam figure standing at the fountainhead of a new humanity and how that whole story we just told, how he from within reverses it, okay? And um, we're going to see how that works. But first, before we read on, there's two little words we have to wrestle with in our first verse today. Very controversial words, but we got to square up to them. The words are this, all sinned, all sinned. And in Christian tradition, this is usually taught as the doctrine of original sin. You ever heard that phrase? Original sin. It refers to the idea that because of our shared origin in Adam, we have inherited this sin nature, this swerve, this urge to rebel against God. And it's in us. We didn't choose it, but we are like de facto guilty before we even do anything. And this, guys, is actually, and in, in, I'm using this word in the technical sense, this is a mystery. Like, if you think you get this and it's like, oh, yeah, I, I totally get that, you're oversimplifying it. Um, one of the smartest fellows who ever lived, um, Blaise Pascal, he was a mathematician, philosopher, French, 17th century. He said this about original sin. It's on point. He says, Certainly, nothing offends us more rudely than this doctrine. It is offensive. And yet, without this mystery, the most incomprehensible of all, we are incomprehensible to ourselves. Like, it's, it's irritating. I find it offensive when I'm told there's something twisted inside of me, that I'm born with some sort of glitch in my soul that I did not choose, that I did not act into, and yet I'm nevertheless on the hook for it. I'm responsible for it. How does that work? And, um, um, well, this basic premise, let's just say, has been hard rejected by modernity the last several hundred years in the West. I mean, if you want to boil down the theological revolution of so-called modernity, or better said, the anti-theological revolution, you could really say this, that it comes down to a rejection, full sweep rejection of the notion that humans are sinners. We're not sinners. We're, we're, we're good. We're not evil, as a popular parenting book today says in its title. We are good inside. No shred of, of wickedness. And because of that little switcheroo, we slam into the final words of Pascal. We have become incomprehensible to ourselves. Like, if you wonder, why is it today that there's such profound confusion surrounding our identity? And I'm not just talking about sexual identity, I'm talking about our political, cultural, spiritual homelessness. As William Butler Yeats, the poet, said, the center cannot hold. Things are fraying. How did that happen? Well, much of it 
derives from the fact that we've canceled sin. We've bracketed out, screened out something fundamental about ourselves. And by the way, I'm not saying, please hear me, I'm not saying that we are only sheer, pure evil, sinful. Not at all. There's good in all of us and evil. They intermingle. But here's the point. If we ignore evil, we become riddles to ourselves. We become mysteries. We are perennially disappointed and disaffected and confused. And yet, interestingly, at the same time, and many have pointed this out, with the erasure of original sin, that's now out of vogue, um, what has taken its place in mainstream culture is a, is a doctrine that looks a whole lot like original sin that says, well, sorry, you're born guilty. And let me tell you how it came about. So in the 19th century European philosophy, there's people who are called masters of suspicion, people like um, Karl Marx and Sigmund Freud and Friedrich Nietzsche. And what these people collectively said in different ways is, what we got to do is pry beneath the appearance of things. And right, right at the place where people think they're being noble and good and humanitarians, right there, you've got to expose the hidden core of evil. That's where it is. And this is usually called, this mode of thought is usually called a hermeneutic of suspicion. It is a way of looking at the world through suspicious eyes. Everything you see, every person, every artifact, every building, every song, every whatever, you have to say, what are you hiding? Who are you excluding? What's in it for you? And then here's the dogma that affects all of us. Wherever you're born, on these intersecting sliding scales of power and privilege, well, you are marked now with inherited guilt, or you receive a halo of victimhood. And there's nothing you can really do about this one way or the other. So what this means, guys, and this is the point that's been made before, is that this modern hermeneutic of suspicion functions in many ways like a secular version of original sin. To say, oh, well, you, you are in fact still born guilty. And by the way, I don't bring this up to ding on secular theory or secular thinkers. I actually think they're onto something important. And do you know why? Well, because with the category sin unavailable, they are compensating for a felt need. You need a tool to try to make sense of evil in the world. And that is what this tool is for them. The only problem is that unlike the biblical doctrine of original sin, secular doctrines of suspicion and critique actually have no room for grace. <laughs> they have no room for trust. They have no room for forgiveness and a fresh start. It's actually kind of ironic because the very people who wrote off Christianity as overboard pessimists about human nature are actually now championing a worldview that says some humans, by virtue of who they unavoidably are, are inherently and irredeemably guilty. There's no hope for you. So it's just kind of sad, to be honest with you. Came full circle. Anyways, this isn't a philosophy class. Uh, I just wanted to, do you wish it was? Because I could go on. Because in the leftover pile from this sermon, there's more fun stuff. Um, but it's not. It's not a philosophy class. I just want to make sure that when the Bible talks about things like death, sin, that we feel the force of what's being talked about, and we have a sense of how those words have been heard in broader culture. That's very, very important. So let's pick up the trail here in, in verse 15. Paul writes this. He says, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For, and notice, one and many. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. So we're back on the map where we started, these two groups, two solidarities. We are either in Adam's sin or we are in Jesus' grace. It's almost like two locations, like you're either in France or you're in Germany. Like it's where you live. You're, you're located there. And um, so Paul sets side by side Adam and Jesus, humanity 1.0, humanity 2.0. And the key words in that verse I just read, the key words to notice are on the Jesus side of the equation, and they are these, two, they are these words much more and abounded, much more and abounded. They point to the fact that the symmetry between Adam and Jesus is not equal. It's asymmetrical. If Adam's sin had such and such an effect for these people, Jesus's grace doesn't just 
kind of fix it. It goes way, way, way beyond it. There is a plus factor, an abundance factor. And I think this is, I think this is at the heart of this dense passage Paul is, is putting out there for us. This is the core idea, that the balance between Adam and Jesus, old humanity and new humanity, is unequal. Why? Because the gift far outweighs the failure. Far outweighs the failure. So, like, imagine a woman who commutes to work every day by her bicycle, okay? She rides her bike to work. Uh, well, one day, she was forgetful, she was stressed, and she forgot to lock it up. Now she comes out after work, she got, the bike was stolen. She's got no bike. Well, a friend hears about this. Oh, no, my friend's bike was stolen. And what the friend says is not, hey, I got this spare bicycle. The friend says, hey, I just bought a Tesla. Why don't you have it? You know, it's yours. You can take this. So this little imaginative example, what's lost is a bike. What's gained is a pretty nice car. You see, the gift far outweighs the failure. That's the idea. Paul is saying that in Jesus, it goes beyond what would have been necessary to fix. So let's try another example. Imagine a prisoner who's on death row. Okay, this, this dude has done some bad, barbaric things. And finally, his day of reckoning arrives. It's over for him. Uh, yet, in the final minutes of his life, he's like eating his last meal. Message comes down from the authorities that that inmate is to be immediately released from prison, fully free. And that evening, he's to come on national television and receive the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And the guy's like, whoa, what just happened to me? Like, I don't, I don't understand. Well, what just happened to you is a super abundance of grace. That's what happened. The gift far outweighs the failure. What Jesus does for us on the good side of the ledger is out of all proportion to what he does or what Adam did on the negative side of the ledger. Guys, do you sense how lavish this is? Do you sense how extravagant God's love for you is? The scales aren't balanced. They're wildly, graciously imbalanced. And the Christian life is about realizing that so that the core of our being becomes one of gratitude, our defining emotion becomes one of joy. But the source of that is realizing what has been done on our behalf. Um, and if you say, how is this possible? Like, I, it's hard to understand how that's possible. Well, think about who Adam and Jesus are. They're very different. Adam is a human made in the image of God. Jesus is God himself come among us. It's just like apples and oranges. Like it's like apples and airplanes. There's, there's no comparison at all. Adam was a man perfectly made by God. And don't fool yourself into thinking that, well, if I was there in Eden, I would have done better. I would have said no. No, you wouldn't. No, you would have done just as bad. Even though we didn't vote for Adam, we couldn't have found or chosen any better representative for us. And he still face plants. Jesus is like Adam in that he's a representative human that we did not choose, very undemocratic, I know, right, your senator, whatever. <laughs> Jesus is like Adam in this way. But he's radically unlike Adam in that he is Adam's maker. <laughs> he is Adam's engineer, bio designer, artist, whatever, however you want to say it, who humbles himself to take on the predicament of one of his own creations. Why? In order to achieve for Adam and all those in Adam what they apparently are unable to do for themselves. So the Christian story, my friends, is about much more than sort of restoring Eden. Let's just get back to the Garden of Eden. No, because Eden was always to expand, to grow, to become better. But that project was cut off. But with Jesus... Things are put back online. He makes possible the kind of life that Eden only embryonically suggested. By the way, you can tell that I think a lot about Eden. I named my daughter Eden. Uh, it's a very, very rich and important biblical idea. Let's read the next couple of verses. We'll try to figure out more about what this means. Verse 16 and 17. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following Many trespasses brought justification, one of the many. For, verse 17, if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, 
Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. It's kind of dense. (laughs) But Paul's still exploring these solidarities, their respective destinies. And one very important feature of what I just read, did you notice the two words, death reigned? Death reigned. It's like it's in charge. The world is under the authority of chaos and entropy and madness and dissolution, destruction. Death is in charge. Now, if we were to guess what the opposite of that might be, the balance statement, we might say, well, through Jesus, maybe life is in charge. Through Jesus, God is now in charge. Those would be good guesses, and they would be wrong. Here's where the twist comes, the surprise, the asymmetry. It's this, that the opposite of death's reign is our reign. That's what it says. I'm not making it up. It says those who receive the abundance of grace, they themselves will reign. Where's that come from? Well, it's picking up and extending the vocation that humankind is given in the Garden of Eden to be a royal priesthood over God's good world, bringing life and beauty and justice and order and joy to the very places where the world is hurting, where it's dry and cracked and out of kilter and sorrowful and suffering. That's what Jesus did. So to be clear, alas, reigning with God doesn't mean what we might think or hope it means. It doesn't really have anything to do with wearing you know, special crowns and having motorcades and paparazzis and a lot of cash. It doesn't mean that. It actually means like pulling the weeds in your backyard and folding the laundry, taking out the trash. It's about walking with your kid to the bus stop, being there when they come home. It's about being honest on your tax returns, not erasing your browsing history. It's about caring for your health holistically, your physical, mental, spiritual, financial health, and the health of those you love. See, reigning with God today in our lives means with wisdom and grace stewarding the little patch of the world that he puts under your influence. So your kingdom is, is your apartment. It is your cubicle. It is your, your very physical body. It's your neighborhood. There is a today component of what it means to reign in life with God. And yet, there is also a tomorrow component as well. Throughout Scripture, we are told in various ways that one day through a mighty act of God, he will restore the world through and through. He will put all things to rights. He will make all things new. And here's the kicker. Those who are faithful to him in this life will reign with him in that life. And what does that mean? What will that look like? To be honest, I don't know. Uh, The Scripture only hints in that direction. It's like signs that point into a bright fog Don't know. We should go that way, but don't know. All I do know, all we do know for sure, is that it's going to be worth it. Paul will say in a couple chapters, in chapter 8 of Romans, he's going to say the sufferings of the present are not even worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed to us. If you put in the scales the suffering now and the glory then, it's all out of balance in our favor. Now, in the Bible, that word glory, uh, it is affiliated with rulership, with kingly and queenly majesty. So if glory will be revealed to us, what's the underlying idea here? It's just exactly what we've been saying, that God's original plan in Eden to steward his creation through faithful human beings, a royal priesthood, that will go forward at last, yet in a way that blows our current imaginations. Like, we can't get there mentally, but that doesn't mean it's not really there. Yes? I have no idea how nuclear fusion works in the sun or fission or whatever it is, but I do know that the sun is shining. Just because I don't understand it doesn't mean it's not, like, real. It's just more real than I can handle. So how does this happen? That we, the the many, are going to experience that day? It's because the one did it. The one died. The one rose again, taking our messed up past, giving us his glorious future, taking our waywardness, giving us his very righteousness, taking our despair and our confusion and our aimlessness and swapping that for purpose, 
for steady hope, for a sense of mission. I have a reason to be alive, actually, and it's much bigger than me. So let's move towards a close with our final few verses. And again, Paul, still driving at this dynamic of the one and the many. He's exploring it. So a couple more verses. Verse 18, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinful, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now, what's amazing is the bargain for Adam and Jesus was very different. Adam was told, hey, if you obey God, it's going to go well for you. But for Jesus, if he obeyed God, you know what that meant for him? Profound suffering. (laughs) It meant uh, following God into the heart of darkness and doing something there that changes the whole game. So it's like, you ever watch a movie, like a thriller mind thriller, and at the end, there's a big reveal moment that makes you want to go back and watch the whole thing from the beginning, because now you know, and you're like, oh, I got to watch that again, because now I see, actually, and I can see the hints and stuff like that. The Bible is like that, in a way, with the revelation of Jesus Christ. How does God deal with sin, which starts on page one? How does God deal with it? By becoming sin. God becomes the most sinful human who ever lived. This is 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for me and you so that we could become the righteousness of God. How does God deal with this death problem? Oh, no. It's profound exile. How does he do it? What's the, how's the solution? To hurdle himself directly into that storm. That's how he does it. And, and boy, you couldn't see that one coming. And what does it mean? How do we... How do we tattoo that, we say what Paul says in the next verses. Grace abounded. Grace abounded. Not just barely enough. Like way more than enough. Verse 20. Now the law came in to increase the trespass. The law, it's like a a projector. You put light under it and a screen in front of it and it's suddenly way bigger and clearer. You see the problem now. Whoa. Whoa. The law came in to increase our awareness of the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign. God might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace still abounds for us today. Whoever you are, wherever you are, Whatever you've done, whatever your background, none of us are so good that we're exempted from sin, alas. And yet none of us are so bad that we're disqualified from grace. And that grace abounds. What we've looked at today, this spiral downward of sin and death, rebellion, extinction. Yeah, we we like exile ourselves. We become split down the middle. I can't even relate to me, much less you or God. And we might get comfortable in that place of alienation. We're like, well, it kind of sucks, but at least it's familiar. I'll just stay here. But for God, that's unacceptable. He looks at you and says, you're not made for isolation. You're not made to be lonely. You're not made to be tormented. You are made to be loved and to love. You are not made for a brittle, defiant autonomy. You are made for a rich, warm community. And so what we're going to do today at the end, we're going to celebrate that God made that possible. This reunion, restoring ourselves to ourselves, to each other, to God. We're going to celebrate communion. Would you grab this out, please? You received it when you came in. Does anybody need one? We've got some folks coming around to give you one if you missed out. Okay. If you say, who is this for? Who gets to do this? Well, it's it's simple. If you belong to Jesus, the body and blood of Jesus belong to you. And what Jesus achieved for us was hinted at Long, long beforehand, in fact, there's this passage from Isaiah that I'm going to read to you that talks about Mount Zion, the place Jesus died and rose again. 
and a place that actually in rabbinic tradition is affiliated with the Garden of Eden. It says on that mountain, God's going to make a feast for the whole world. It's going to be blood and it's going to be uh, meat for the whole world. And you know what is going to be the meaning of that meal? That God himself swallows death. It's a profound passage foreshadowing what we do here. Listen to these words. And then my dad is going to lead us in communion. Isaiah 25, 6 through 9. On this mountain, Zion, the Lord of hosts, will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine, well-refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We've waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We've waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Amen. Amen. You have your communion service in hand. Of course, uh, that bit of bread represents his broken body, and that little bit of juice represents his shed blood. Because while we were sinners, yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so we just looked at um, Isaiah 25, and we see the foreshadowing of a great meal or feast of reconciliation. There will be a time of peace between God and mankind. And that has been not only initiated, but fully realized through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And that's what happens when we eat and drink together like this. We come to ground zero of the Christian faith. Believers like you and me on every continent, every nation for the last 2,000 years have been doing what we are doing right now. Why? To remember him. Listen, I received from the Lord what I'm passing on to you that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed. Now think about it. Greatest night of betrayal, his greatest act of love he took bread. Go ahead and take that bit of bread in hand. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. When you eat it, remember me. Father, before we eat the bread, we pause. And from the bottom of our hearts, we say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you that you who knew no sin became sin for us. Thank you. Let's eat together. After they'd shared bread, then they shared from a common cup. Take that cup in hand, would you please? And Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant. If law came through Moses in the Old Testament, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, the new covenant. In my blood, do this whenever you drink it. And remember me, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. That's the promise, everybody. Hold that cup aloft, would you please? Father God, we come in Jesus' name. And Father, with all of our hearts, we say thank you. We, we, we cite the, the hymn of old, what can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. And so this cup, we hold aloft, which represents your shed blood. In a moment, we'll drink. As a moment ago, we ate. And we will say from the bottom of our hearts, thank you, God, for saving me. In Jesus' name, let's drink together. Thank you, friends. It's always wonderful to study the scriptures together, to raise our voices together. Would you stand to your feet? I'd love to leave you with a blessing before we head out.
this is a blessing for the many of which we are a part because it's made possible because of the one. It says this, it may be true for you today, this week, this afternoon, going forward. My friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face upon you and in the name of Jesus give you shalom, give you peace. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next time.